Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Rancho Mirage City Council Library and Observatory Board meeting. This is also the Housing Authority Board and the City Council representing the Redevelopment Successor Agency. And this is a regular meeting. It is Thursday, March 5th at 1 o'clock. And normally we start off with our flag salute, but I wanted to make mention of one thing before we stand for our flag salute. And it's, I wanted to announce with great sadness that we recently heard that a very dear friend and beloved person in Rancho Mirage, Charlie Rich, has passed away. And um, it's with great sadness. So when we stand for the flag salute, if you would please stand an extra moment to remember him with great honor, that would be appreciated. Okay, please stand. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, the of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Aaron, would you like to join us? Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, City Council, and City Staff. Um, as Mayor Smotrich uh, made the announcement, uh, we lost uh, a key figure in the city of Rancho Mirage. Uh, Charles Rich was a wonderful man who touched many of our hearts while living in the city of Rancho Mirage for 20 years. He is survived by his wife of 57 years, Mary Rich, and two sons, Charles and Christopher. Charles served as the Rancho Mirage, uh, Rancho Mirage Public Library Foundation Board of Directors, as well as being our board president during his tenure. He represented the city of Rancho Mirage as a city delegate to the Rancho, or I'm sorry, to the Coachella Valley Mosquito and Vector Control District. He served in the city in both of these capacities for several years. Charles was a fixture in Rancho Mirage City Council meetings for many years as well. Library staff already misses Charlie as he walks through the library, baseball, uh, baseball hat in hand, going to get his favorite paper, to sit in his favorite chair in the popular reading room. Charlie's love for the city of Rancho Mirage was second to none, and he will be missed, but not forgotten. Thank you, Aaron. Are there any comments from council members that would like to uh, yes, say Yes, I'd like to make a comment. Um, I had the uh, honor uh, of accompanying Randy Binder to Charlie's house uh, and present him with a key to the city. Uh, Charlie wasn't, you know, very mobile at that time, but he took such pride in receiving this key, and it was such a great honor, and uh, it was a feeling that I received from Charlie that I will never forget. And uh, Charlie, uh, we all wish you the best where you are. And thank you for giving me the privilege of, uh, of presenting that key to you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on this side? Okay, okay. Dana. Like I was in Ted, I... Uh... Like Iris and Ted, I had uh, lunch with Charlie every now and then, and um, uh, he's just one of the sweetest guys. Uh, as much as you want him to say something nasty about somebody you want to say something nasty about, Charlie wouldn't do it. He's just a good person that everybody liked, and we will miss him and wish uh, his uh, family Godspeed. Thank you. Yes, the, um, I go back a way, way, way back with him when he was involved with the Chamber of Commerce also, which wasn't, wasn't mentioned. And uh, he was very instrumental with me and with his family in uh, coaching me on to run for this seat that I now sit in. And uh, he was a very great personality, always had a smile on his face and he'll be dearly remembered by me and all of us. God bless you. Thank you, Charlie. Richard? Just a brief comment. Like everybody else has said, he always had a smile. He was always a great guy to be around, and certainly we will all miss him. 
Indeed, we will all miss him, and our thoughts and our prayers go out to Mary and his entire family. And so now, Kirstie, would you please call roll? Certainly. Council Member Kite? Here. Council Member Townsend? Here. Council Member Weil? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Hobart? Here. And Mayor Smotrich? Here. Okay, and now we'll move on to a, a presentation by someone who's very also dear to us. Uh, she is Alyssa Rod Randolph, and she is the senior manager of uh, IMG, and she's going to tell us a little bit about our uh, Inspiration uh, Golf Tournament by ANA. Come on up. Thank you so much. First off, I just want to say thank you so much to the city of Rancho Mirage for having me today and for your continued partnership with the ANA Inspiration. We've grown to be a family between all of our stakeholders, uh, city of Rancho Mirage, all Nippon Airways, IMG, and of course, the LPGA Ladies Professional Golf Association. For those tuning in, uh, or who may not know, the ANA Inspiration is golf's first major held here in Rancho Mirage. And in 1972, David Foster and Dinah Shore came together to create this event. And it changed women's golf landscape with the largest purse in women's golf and women's sports and the championship venue, it set the new standard. For the last 48 years, as we head into our 49th year, the best female athletes from around the world travel here with spectators, partners, families to watch and to take a look at the famous leap into Poppy's Pond. In 2015, All Nippon Airways came on board as our new title partner. All Nippon Airways, for those who do not know, is a five-star Japanese airline. Uh, they're headquartered in Tokyo, Japan. And they have 11 North America gateway cities where they fly out of to Tokyo. And of course, the closest one is Los Angeles, so LAX. ANA has been a great partner and has come together for our events. They're always bringing new ideas. They're heavily integrated into decisions and with the utmost respect and objectives on how to honor the history of the event, how to grow together with the community and with the city of Rancho Mirage, providing a platform for women and women's golf and last but not least, prioritizing the future generation. Before taking a quick dip into 2020, let's take a look back to 2019. All right, tell me how to play this one now, Jude. Looks like it's going to be a little bump and run. Uh, that's how you play it. <laughs> Save that video. Not seen that before. Those tickets for a hole in one on A and A. Let's get for it to go. Oh, right. Going right into the hole. Oh. For those who don't know, that's our famous Poppy's Pond jump. 
And that was our 2019 champion, Jin Young Ko. And that was her first major championship. She later went on to win another major at the end of the season and has since held the world number one ranking. As we welcome back Jin Young Ko this year, we also have several notables and an additional nine other past champions of the ANA Inspiration that will join along. As you can see those notables, Lexi Thompson, Brooke Henderson, Georgia Hall, Brittany Lincecum, Lydia Ko, Pernilla Lindbergh, and Jin Young Ko are the ones that we welcome back as our past champions. And along with those, um, LPGA players that we have joining us. When Dinah Shore first started the event, it was important for her to provide a platform for young women and young amateurs who are aspiring to become an LPGA player. And with that, we still honor that tradition today. So I wanted, as we well know, all of these LPGA players, we might not know the six amateurs who will play as well. So I wanted to talk a little bit about who we get to welcome to Rancho Mirage this year. They are very talented. They're the most talented amateurs in the world with the following accomplishments. The world number one junior player in the world, we welcome Rose Zhang. Second, the reigning US junior girls champion, we welcome Angelina Yi. The reigning U.S. Women's Amateur Champion, we welcome Gabriella Ruffles. Our fourth one, Ireland's top female amateur and three-time All-American at Arizona State University, we welcome Olivia Mahethy. The fifth one is 2016 Four Ball in the United States Champion. She's also a Big 12 Player of the Year at the University of Texas as a senior, and her name's Caitlin Papp. And last but not least, uh, held the weekend prior, is our final exemption into the ANA Inspiration. And what that means is there's 48 junior girls from around the world who come to compete in Rancho Mirage and play the Dinah Shore course for the final spot into the ANA Inspiration. As if that's not good enough, they get to play with the ANA Inspiration past champions during the final round, which fosters mentorship between two generations. So there's a glimpse into our 2020 field. <coughs> so now that we know who's coming, how do you get involved? How do you come out? How do you get to come to Mission Hills to watch? So we have our junior inspiration, which is free to all those who want to come. And that's on March 28th and 29th the weekend prior. And starting on April 1st, we have our official program, and that's the first day that grounds and admission open the gates, and that's starting at $15. With the grounds access, you get to walk the hallowed grounds of Mission Hills Country Club, get to experience uh, the 49 years of history, and watch some of the best athletes in the world. With new this year, we have new hospitality, which is very exciting, our new build, uh, which will look and feel very different. And with that, we are building a new structure uh, behind number 18 green on the water, and that will be called our 1972 club. Uh, that is an upgraded grounds pass uh, that you'll be able to sit and view. Um, as people come into 18 green, and that starts at only $75. Uh, last and not least, we have our Poppy's Pavilion, and this is um, a ticket where you get to watch one of the best views of Poppy's Pavilion or Poppy's Pond Jump, and that includes all food and beverage, uh, VIP parking, and of course that starts at 229 per day. 
So if you would like to buy any tickets, please just visit ananspiration.com. And of course, again, gates open on Wednesday, April 1st, and the final round is on Sunday, April 5th. So Spectator Village, as we looked um, in the last year to provide a better experience to all of our partners, our spectators, and the city of Rancho Mirage, we wanted to create a space um, that really fostered where people could hang out, where they could enjoy time, where if they don't want to walk out on the golf course, that they could spend time in our spectator village. So I just wanted to highlight uh, a couple items that we would be including this year beyond golf. Uh, number one, we have our beer garden that will be in Spectator Village and Babe's uh, Barbecue, who's also located here in Rancho Mirage at the river, will be uh, pouring their beer out of tap along with Highmark, uh, Golden Road, La Quinta Brewing, and Four Peaks. Additionally, we have concessions all in this area with TVs, so you'll get to sit down and eat and maybe have a beer. And don't forget that we have Bloody Marys in the morning at the beer garden to help get you kick-started. Um, sec or third, we also have shopping. So there's only one week out of the entire year that you can come shopping in a special ANA Inspiration merchandise tent. Um, in addition to our merchandise, we also have Jeffrey Scott Magnetics, uh, a cosmetics company named Leaders Cosmetics, St. Nine, who is creating a new golf ball, and then the famous S Farms, which are the sun sleeves to help protect you from the sun. So you'll get to go on a little shopping in the Spectator Village. And last but definitely not least, the famous Brandini and Brandini milkshakes that always create the biggest hit in Spectator Village. They'll be coming back. And of course, if you're not able to make it on site, that's okay. We have another opportunity of where you can join, and that's on Golf Channel. Um, we have 20 hours of live coverage on Golf Channel from Thursday, April 2nd through Sunday, April 5th. Uh, Thursday and Friday, the local times coverage are 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. And then on Saturday and Sunday, it's 2 to 6 p.m., so prime time on the East Coast. So we look forward to having everyone join us this year and tune in April 2nd through 5th as we celebrate our 49th year anniversary and build up to the 50th anniversary in 2021. And thank you so much to the city of Rancho Mirage for your continuing partnership and for allowing me to speak today. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. It's always a joy to have you here, and it's always great to get these updates, and we know that there's lots of exciting plans in the future, and uh, yeah. it's, we're going to be able to see them real soon. So are there any comments? From Alyssa, uh, is the mayor going to have an opportunity to jump in the pond this year? <laughs> I think we can sneak you a dip in there. Yeah, okay. We keep trying every year. Yeah. I, I, hey, I bring my flippers. I'm all set. <laughs> okay. Anyone on this side? Yes, I do. I just want to tell you how wonderful it is to know that you guys massage this every year, and it gets bigger and better, and all the new innovations you are bringing this year. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you again, and uh, we wish you all the very best, and we're looking forward to seeing you out there on the greens. Thank you. All right, you take care. You too. Thank you. Okay. You did great. Oh, thank very you. Very good. Okay. So now we'll move on to our non-agenda public comments, and this is an opportunity for the public to speak on issues that are not on the agenda for a maximum of three minutes per speaker. And if you have not filled out a yellow card to come up and speak at our podium, you're more than welcome to do so, or you can wait until everyone has spoken and you will be welcome to come up to the podium at that time. So we have three cards here, and uh, the first one is Brad Artson, and actually Brad has filled out two cards, so we're going to allow you uh, six minutes, and you can just go from one item to the next. Uh, thank you very much, Brad Anderson. I live on Ferber Drive in the city of Ranch Mirage. Uh, I think one of the uh, one of the karmic cards for 
was for closed session item. And if you want, I can go ahead and speak on that topic at sure. this time. Okay. Uh, first, uh, I'm sorry, I'll start with the public comment. Uh, I, I want to bring the attention that, to the councillor again. I, I made uh, made several requests over several years uh, about a neighbor that I have that's been conducting a home-based business forever. And um, recently, uh, probably within the last few months, I guess, uh, they've they've stuck up like 20 spotlights around. I'm not I'm not, I'm not associating it. Spotlights on the eaves on the top of the house, and uh, they they're pointed onto my property, and and it's uh, it's it's annoying. Uh, and I brought it up, but I haven't heard back from code compliance or the city manager concerning those topics. And I I, I believe it's intentional, uh, but uh, again, I don't know that for sure, but I'm pretty sure it is. And and I guess my main concern, I've said it before. Uh, Certain influences have been allowed to let that business remain in this residential neighborhood, and and I just urge, if you're going to allow that to happen, that you let it happen to everybody. Let everybody run a business out of the house, and let everybody stick spotlights on the house. Uh, I know it's it's, but anyway, uh, that's kind of all I have to say about that. And, oh, uh, I wanted to mention too. I noticed there was a, I think the last meeting I did get to attend, but I, I noticed it. Uh, on the internet, I guess. Uh, but uh, there was some talk about one of the potential candidates running against the city or against one of the incumbents or both of them. And and my main issue with that is, again, most people, I've, I've looked at uh, one of the candidates that was spoken about and before this even was mentioned. And of course, <laughs> he, he's a good California candidate, but uh, I don't think he has the support in the city. But he wouldn't even have a chance if if certain special interests were like looked at from the candidates like businesses in residential neighborhoods and and influences over nonprofits and so forth. But uh, we'll see how that plays out. But uh, and my uh, non comments on the special district or not the special districts. Let me go in there on the uh, closed session item was for item three and that's the uh, save ranch mirage and and the, versus the city of ranch uh, save. Save Ransom Mirage and versus City of Ransom Mirage court case, I guess, or litigation. I would plead with you, please conclude that and let the city move on uh, because that's one of the reasons I don't litigate against the city because I don't want to sue my neighbors. I don't want my neighbors paying for litigation and more attorney costs and, and outside attorney agencies coming in. Uh, uh, so I would hope that you conclude that uh, so the city can move on from that and move on to better and bigger things. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, the next speaker we have listed is Wally Melendez. Uh, good afternoon, uh, City Council, uh, staff, employees, contractors, and we the people. Thanks for the Brown Act that the public has a chance to address uh, a city council and the staff of, um, of the government of, um, of a town or a <clears throat> of a city. And I'm speaking as a friend of all the communities of the Coachella Valley. I'm gonna bring up two items. <clears throat> One is that the um, so-called College of the Desert that is situated in the jurisdiction of Palm Desert could be the Harvard of the Imperial uh, Valley if the administrators at that institution would uh, use their imaginations and <clears throat> uh, think and push forward with, with that idea because we lose a lot of very, we lose a lot of the young, energetic uh, talent that are starting out in the world. And I was just at the cafeteria at the college just a couple of days ago, 
And mm, I can see in their faces their inexperience and their um, anxiety, probably on all the extra work that's given to them unnecessarily by unqualified instructors that do not belong to the Coachella Bell. The second item that I want to bring up is that today, on March the 5th, 2020, I want to announce the initiation of an organization of an association that I'm starting called, and it's going to be called the IBLW, International Brotherhood of Landscape Workers, which those workers need a lot of help because they, 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 they work with insecticides, pesticides, herbicides, which we all know are poisonous chemicals. And a lot of those people die young and they get sick and uh, most of them are Hispanic workers. I'm starting that or, uh, labor organization right now as of this moment. <clears throat> My name is Wally Melendez, and I'm giving authority to the city of Rancho Mirage that if anybody calls to ask for my email, you have my permission to give them my email. I won't give you my telephone number because I don't answer the telephone anymore. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, well that's the end of our formal uh, comments. Is there anyone in the uh, public that would like to make any additional comments? Seeing none, we'll close the public comments and we will move on to uh, the City Council board member comments and reports. And we'll start with Charlie. Thank you, Mayor. Cole Porter's Anything Goes, the musical, was performed at the Rancho Mirage Amphitheater this last February 21st and 22nd to a sellout crowd on both nights. Now we will show you an expert from this outstanding performance, so please roll the film. about that right here in little old Rancho Mirage. Lamone Car Productions in partnership with the city of Rancho Mirage presented another outstanding musical extravaganza of this timely Broadway musical which you just saw. This season's second production was an amazing program of song, dance, and fun as you saw, featuring a cast of 24 singing and dancing to a full orchestra along with a dining experience with a three-course gourmet menu from Aqua California Bistro at the River. The award-winning Lamone Car production is making its mark at the amphitheater for the second season. The next show is mostly Broadway on March 28th with guest star David Burham. He's a Broadway star and recording artist, followed by the infamous Mamma Mia full production on April 17th and 18th. This entertainment show legend will appear at our theater with a cast of 24 full orchestra for those two nights. Closing the season this year with Roger and Hammerstein's A Grand Night for Singing on May the 23rd. 
Dinner seating and open seating reservations for these shows are now being taken at www.deserttheatricals.com or call 760-620-5993. I urge you to make your reservations for any and all of these outstanding shows and be part of the hundreds of Valley folks who have enjoyed their evening with these award-winning Limon Car Rancho Mirage productions. We are proud of our Rancho Mirage, our, our Hollywood Bowl amphitheater experience. The only venue in the valley bringing you this outstanding theater and dinner experience under the stars. Thanks to all of you who have enjoyed these productions, and we are looking forward to the 21-22 season to share with you all. <clears throat> Again, for all the other events at the theater this season, including the free concert series, which features Rodney Atkins' performance on Saturday, March the 7th, Roberta Gambarini on Saturday, March the 14th, 38 special on Saturday, March the 21st, for more information on these free events, call City Hall at 760-324-4511, extension 228. <clears throat> also, this year, Rancho Mirage is the host city for the Senior Inspiration Award luncheons. And I am pleased to have had the opportunity to be the chairman with the committee for this event representing Rancho Mirage. Tickets are on sale for the 2020 Season Inspiration Awards, the 28th annual honoring 11 outstanding volunteer seniors, citizens 65 years and older who have inspired others through their volunteerism and contributions to the community. These senior citizens are from Riverside County in all nine of the Coachella Valley cities. More than 500 people annually attend this luncheon, which will be held at 11.30 a.m. Friday, March 13th, at the Omni Rancho Las Palmas in Rancho Mirage, located at 41000 Bob Hope Drive. The city of Rancho Mirage will be honoring at this event Robert Schwartz, and Mr. Schwartz is here with me now. If you stand up and take a bow, Robert. Where are you? There he is, oh, right back there. Thank you. Congratulations, Mr. Schwartz. It's a great honor that you're being bestowed upon, and you deserve it. Tickets are on sale online at seniorinspirationawards.org. Tickets are also available to purchase by calling Amy Chu at 760-863-2556. Thank you, Mayor. Well, mm -hmm. thank you so much. Thank that was you. very informative, and what a joy to hear what's going on. Thank you. Okay, now moving on to Richard. Thank you, Mayor. I have the great privilege today of in introducing the Rancho Mirage Citizens on Patrol. I'd like to ask them all to stand, if you would, please. And Captain Schwartz, would you like to come down and take a moment and introduce the members of this great group to our audience? Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, before I start, I would uh, like to thank the council members, staff, um, the Rancho Mirage Police Department, uh, for the um, um, support that you've extended to us over the past uh, 26 years. Um, I have brought a few of our road warriors with us. Guys, please sit down and I'll just introduce them <coughs> one by one. Uh, and, and I will, I think they deserve to be introduced individually. And I see if I can remember all their names. <laughs> okay. We'll start with Alfonso Carpenter. Al, thank you. Uh, next to him is Bill Sachs. He's our, uh, he's our numbers guy. He's the one who keeps our statistics. Thank you, Bill. Ron Shipper, who is my uh, adjutant. 
Thank you, Ron. Uh, Ken Ring, uh, Ringold, who is uh, uh, fairly new, but a great asset to our organization. And next to him is Jim Freeman, who preceded me as captain. Um, Jeff Shapiro, recently returned to the Valley. Mary Silva, who is our quartermaster and keeps us in the uniforms that the city provides. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Cheryl Rockwell, who assists Mary. Thank you, Cheryl. Charlene Corbet, who is also uh, um, one of our road warriors. D. Colacheco, who is an original member, I believe. She's been with us for 26 years. Um, Rich Ronzello, who keeps our equipment going, takes care of our cars and all of our equipment. Um, Steve Ezer, who, another one of our road warriors, and sitting next to him, even though the average age of our group is close to 70, our youngest member, Spencer McQuinn, is 26. Oh. I think that's all. And again, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate all the effort that you've put forth for us, and we hope to continue in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how, how many members do you have in the COPS right now? I'm sorry? How many members in the COPS? About 34. 34. That's great. Yes. Congratulations, Congratulations to you all. Congratulations all those names. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Good for you. Thank you. How many barbers do you have in your group? <laughs> you know the one that we have in our group. Gilbert Dozel, right? Right, yeah. he, I'm sorry he's not here, but he's a member of our group, too. Thank you, Bob. Okay, thank you, you very much. It. Thank you. Thank you. The, All right. the COPS program was formed in 1994, and here's a, pic a picture of our current club. Wow. <clears throat> the COPS patrolled 3,886 hours in 2019. That averages about 10.6 hours a day. And they do a great job. You see them all over the city. On any given day, there may be three vehicles and up to two COPS members per vehicle pulling the streets of Rancho Mirage. I want to thank the COPS for their hard work and keeping the streets of Rancho Mirage safe. And if you're interested in serving as a COPS member, please call City Hall at 760-324-4511 and keep up the great job. You all are really a blessing to our city. Thank you again. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. That's it, Richard? That's it. Thank Off you. Okay. Moving on to Ted. Thank you, Iris. <clears throat> Uh, my comments today have to do with what I consider the single most important responsibility of our city, and that's public safety. The city of Rancho Mirage has continued to take proactive steps in addressing potential crime in the community. The city of Rancho Mirage has incorporated numerous strategies in partnership with the Riverside County Sheriff's Department to reach this goal, one of which includes the investment in automatic license plate reader technology. Automatic license plate reader technology consists of cameras that automatically take photographs of vehicle license plates, which are then translated into letters and numbers. The resulting data is compared to law enforcement databases to see if the vehicle has been reported stolen, wanted for its use in a crime, or is displaying a lost or stolen license plate. If the license plate number is found to be wanted, the system alerts deputies so they can investigate further. The use of automatic, automated license plate reader technology is a valuable law enforcement tool, assistant, assisting in identifying stolen or wanted vehicles, vehicles associated with missing or wanted people, 
and stolen license plates. The city has also invested in DUI preliminary alcohol screening devices, which assist sheriff personnel in their field operations during their daily enforcement activities. These screening devices prove effective in streamlining the DUI screening process. And, and then when I talk about DUI, I'm talking about impairment of any kind, not just necessarily alcohol, but it can also be drug-related as it relates to driving erratically and so forth. Rancho Mirage's sheriff personnel also provides crime prevention screening services for residences and businesses. This is extremely important, and I would encourage you to make a note of the number that I'm going to give you in a moment. One of the most prominent programs they offer is crime prevention through environmental design. This program is based on the principle that proper design and effective use of buildings and public spaces in neighborhoods can produce, excuse me, can reduce incidents of crime and improve the quality of life for citizens. A central tenant of this program is that Rancho Mirage residents may request an inspection of their homes or businesses for potential exposure to crime. Upon assessment, sheriff personnel will provide an analysis and make recommendations to address any potential outstanding exposures. This service acts as a significant benefit to the community and its crime reduction efforts. To receive this service, you may call the Sheriff's Department Crime Prevention Office at 760-836-1600. I want to repeat that because this is a free service, which means that the law enforcement and Sheriff's Department will inspect your home and make recommendations. Once again, their office number is 760-836-1600. In addition to the initiatives described, the Rancho Mirage Sheriff's Department also recently acquired a substation at the Eisenhower Medical Center campus. Eisenhower Medical Center supplied the substation at no cost to the city or to the Sheriff's Department. <clears throat> this substation represents the second, the second sheriff substation within the city of Rancho Mirage, with the first located at the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory. The addition of the Eisenhower Medical Center substation allows for a more forward deployment station for the northern section of the city. This new substation will continue to act as a major benefit as a, as a major benefit for our sheriff's department in their law enforcement efforts within our city. The city of Rancho Mirage will continue to taking proactive measures to addri address crime and is ever thankful for the partnership it shares with the Riverside County Sheriff's Department. To give you an idea of the progress that's being made, that in Rancho Mirage, the type of crime we have are essentially would be burglary and larceny. And many times we have found that this is a result of people leaving doors or windows open. Between 2018 and 19, the amount of burglaries, the percentage, decreased 10 percent. Larceny decreased 11 percent and motor vehicle theft decreased 21%. So great progress has been made. We are most indebted to our Sheriff's <coughs> Department for the job they do. And here, this service is available to you to have your own home inspected. But it takes us, every one of us, to be vigilant and careful about how we leave our home secured and locked uh, at all times. Thank you very much, Iris. Well, thank you.
And uh, I think we've finished everyone's comments. Dana, you had nothing to say? No. Okay. So I have three items on my list, but before I move on to that, I wanted to take a few moments to address another issue. And that is because at our last city council meeting on February 20th, a resident named Laura Clark spoke at our podium during the portion of our meeting dedicated to public comments on items that are not on the agenda. Ms. Clark told the council, the audience, and viewers that I made a statement at the city council meeting on October 3rd, 2019, that I was against adding more family restaurants. In fact, she quoted me saying that I had said, we don't need more family restaurants. Then she continued on criticizing me and the council over our decision to approve the In-N-Out Burger Project. Unfortunately, for reasons known only to Ms. Clark, she took my comments completely out of context, and she also neglected to state that I was quoting and paraphrasing the many people who had personally complained to me not only about the Spaghetti Factory restaurant filling the space vacated by the Bing Crosby restaurant, but also about the variety of other complaints I had received related to other Rancho Mirage projects. These were complaints I had heard through the years, both before I became a council member and during my years on the council. Complaints related to unwanted smells from other restaurants in Rancho Mirage, along with unwanted traffic and noise complaints, issues which never materialized. Unfortunately, in listening to Ms. Clark quoting me, it was quite apparent to me that she either didn't actually hear my comments on October 3rd, has very selective hearing, or totally missed the crucial points of my comments. So, for the public benefit and the, for the sake of public transparency, <clears throat> and to show the proper context of my comments, I have asked staff to play the video of my comments I made at the October 3rd, 2019 council meeting. If you have not seen this video, I think you'll find it interesting. And if you have already seen it, it will just refresh your memory. Thank you. Jason? I too have been sitting here and listening very carefully. And uh, uh, I read every letter that came my way in regard to this project. I've done my own research. I've talked to a lot of people. And I'm thinking of all the businesses that have gone out of business. A couple were mentioned here, a couple were not. <clears throat> Sears, Montgomery Ward, May Company, Robinsons, Bullocks, Gottschalks, Broadway, Burlington Coat Factory, and we know the kind of condition that's in right now. A lot of restaurants have gone out of business. Caro's, Coco's, the Denny's at the base of my street in Los Angeles went out of business. The Denny's over here on Monterey and Highway 111 had been empty for how many years? Rancho Mirage has seen its own closures. Applebee's, the Chinese restaurant, Ruby's, Mimi's, Chili's, Vaughn's, the Pavilions, the Green Market, Marie Callender's, Johnny Rockets, and one of my very favorites that I used to frequent at least once a week, the Elephant Bar. How did that happen? How does all of this happen? Um, we saw the closures of Vons in this shopping center, could not maintain itself. Now Forever 21, it's going to be a problem. 
It was suggested in the newspaper that it be turned into a gym or try another market. Or how about a bowling alley, it was suggested. I'm also thinking about all the concerns and complaints I've heard through the years. Before I got on the council and, bef and while I've been on the council. And that's okay. That's just part of my job. It's a part of all of our jobs. But I heard about Roy's and Dickie's greasy smells. Never came to pass. All these places, if they need it, they use their air scrubbers. The casino, Agua Caliente Casino, and the huge sign that they put up, that big, what, five, six, seven story sign. Those were the things that people talked about that were going to lower all of their home values. In fact, some people that lived in my own development over there said, we're going to have to just give our homes away. They're not going to be worth anything. And then we hear about the amphitheaters, our beautiful amphitheaters, about the light and the sound and how disastrous it's going to be for the neighborhood. It's going to lower our home values. And the crime and the noise it's going to bring. Also about the Armenian church and the dome that was being put up on top. For sure, it's going to ruin the views, going to ruin the home values. They're going to have kids running around everywhere on the streets. And also the Ritz-Carlton, when it was being talked about and proposed, and there were people who said, we don't want to look up at that. We're driving down 111. We're on the valley floor. We don't want to look up at that building. And when the spaghetti factory was suggested for the old Bing Crosby restaurant, which could not maintain itself either, people said, how demeaning that you should put a spaghetti factory into that beautiful property that is so valuable. We don't need another family restaurant in Rancho Mirage. So yes, things have really changed, no doubt about it. We do lock our doors. We don't let our children play on the front lawn anymore without supervision. Most people want to walk their, walk their children to school for safety reasons. Things have changed dramatically. Most people want to order everything online. They prefer to sit behind a desk, very often in their pajamas. And they want the convenience and the comfort of not having to go out and either go to restaurants or go to stores to buy items that they can get easily online or with a phone call. <clears throat> they even order their food online. They have the food delivered to them so they don't have to go out. Or they pick up the food and bring it back so they can spend time with their families or sit in front of their computer and do their work. Things have really changed. One of the things, though, that we know is that people love drive throughs There's just no doubt about it. They love the convenience, the fact that they may be disabled and not be able to get out of their car, or the fact that it might be very hot in the middle of our summer, the fact that it might be dark and they don't want to walk into a restaurant and walk through a parking lot, and the fact that we have so many workers that get off work late. They're service people. Rancho Mirage is an incredibly service-oriented city. We have our hotels. We have our law enforcement personnel. We have our firefighting personnel. We have our hospital personnel. These are the people who appreciate a late night meal when no place else is open. They love the convenience, they love the comfort. 
And all the time when everything has changed, Rancho Mirage has grown dramatically. And you quoted each of us and things we said and how proud we are of our city and how proud we are of the work that we do in our city. So even though things are changing and not always for the best, Rancho Mirage still has a world-class library and observatory that offers programs and lectures and concerts free of charge. We have a renowned amphitheater that shows movies and musical presentations. We have a fabulous children's museum. We are considered not just the playground of presidents, we are considered the cultural center of the Coachella Valley. We also have four state-of-the-art city parks. It doesn't get much better. And I've worked in a number of cities, in California, in Nevada, in Arizona, Orange County, downtown LA, Central California. I've worked with staff members. I've worked with city councils. There is no place like Rancho Mirage. And nothing is going to change as far as the quality of the life we provide, the quality of the life we all want to live. We are so thrilled that you have the freedom to come here and voice your opinion and that we really listen to you. And we are assuring you that your quality of life is not going to change because we don't want our quality of life to change. Thank you very much. And thank you, Jason. So I hope for Ms. Clark and others that this video sheds light and provides them all with perspective on my comments. Comments that Ms. Clark tried to use against me publicly, which were needless to say, incorrect. I hope that Ms. Clark and others realize the importance of maintaining accuracy, especially when quoting others, and especially when quoting a high-ranking city official. And what is so ironic about Ms. Clark's accusation is that over the last 30 years, my husband and I have eaten dinner out at least six nights a week, and sometimes seven nights, depending on the number of community and charitable events we attend. And just for the record, I actually happen to be a very good cook. But we absolutely love dining out with friends. We love maintaining old friendships and creating new ones. We love trying new restaurants. We love frequenting our favorite restaurants. And we love supporting eating establishments, not only in Rancho Mirage, but throughout the entire Coachella Valley. So whether our dinners out include casual Italian, Mexican, French, Chinese, or Japanese restaurants, or just grabbing a casual hamburger or hot dog at a fast food place, we always agree on one thing. Rancho Mirage does not have enough family restaurants. And we can only hope that soon we will get more of them. And uh, I hope that this resonates well with the viewers. So my husband and I always say, and we always have lived by, that we never miss a meal. And what could be better than breaking bread with new friends, with seasoned friends, and doing it all in Rancho Mirage? Thank you so much. Okay, now I'd like to move on to my regular comments. And that is something that I would like to start with because today I'd like to share with you a wonderful event taking place at the river at Rancho Mirage. And that is the annual All-American Duck Pluck, put on by the Children's Discovery Museum of the Desert. This event 
takes place on Saturday, March 21st, at the river at Rancho Mirage, with festivities beginning at 11 a.m., with the plucking beginning at 2.30 p.m. So what is a duck pluck, you ask? Well, it is the big spring fundraiser for the Children's Discovery Museum of the Desert. Each adopted duck is an entry into the drawing for prizes. But instead of picking tickets for an opportunity drawing, the museum will pluck cute little rubber ducks from the river. The more ducks you adopt, the greater your chances of winning one of the amazing prizes or gift cards. All you need to do is click on www.cdmod.org to adopt your duck today. You can choose to adopt one, three, or seven ducks, or a whole fleet, which is 15 ducks. Then come to the river and enjoy lots of exciting activities in the amphitheater, waiting for the ducks to be plucked and prizes to be given out to the winners. There are some great activities that are fun for the whole family. There will be water-resistant duck art, a bubble table, a builder blue block area, plus lots, lots more. It's a great family outing, so make sure to put the date on your calendar. That's March 5 at 11.30 a.m. And don't forget, there are lots of great restaurants at the river for brunch, an early dinner, or maybe you can make time to take them in a movie and then have dinner. The Children's Discovery Museum always puts on very creative activities, and this one promises to be another great day for the entire family and surrounding <coughs> community members. So I'll be there, and I hope you can come too. Mm -hmm. So can you um, call on me? I can call you? All right. Can you call on me? I'll call on you. All right. Uh, as you were talking and everybody was, uh, I was thinking of a situation that involved uh, me and my uh, dog uh, just a few days ago. And it reminded me when I was listening to the things you were saying, I was, it reminded me that I really would like to remind people who have dogs and if you have swimming pools, that your dog has a way out. Uh, the other day, I heard my little 18-year-old uh, Rosie. Uh, I didn't know it was Rosie. It was just little peeps, little sounds. And I'm looking through the house to find out where these sounds were coming from. And uh, I couldn't find them. I thought my wife was playing a trick on me. <clears throat> I saw her. She wasn't, uh, at least not at that moment. And uh, I was standing in the kitchen, and those chirps got louder and louder. And uh, I happened to look out the kitchen window to the pool. And about 10 or 15 feet out is the pool and then the, um, <clears throat> the water at the, at the deep end, nine feet deep at that end. <clears throat> and there was my 18-year-old Rosie screaming and circling, uh, and make a long story short, uh, I don't recommend swimming in the middle of March uh, in an unheated pool, which is what Rosie and I did. But I finally got my hands, on, one hand on her, and I had my gym clothes on, I'd been at the gym. And uh, so with one hand and Rosie, I finally got us up to the edge, and my wife came out. Um, she's 18 years old, wouldn't have lost much life, but she would have lost a great life. And I just thought I'd remind people <clears throat> that uh, have a plan when you um, have your dogs out <clears throat> and you have a pool nearby. Have a plan that protects them, and you'll be glad you did. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Dana. And I Iris, think, yes. I just want to go back to what you just did. Okay, well, let me let me just make one more comment. Okay, but I want to comment on that. Okay, thank you. Related to Dana's comment, because I think a lot of us forget, especially in the summertime, that you know children and pets are drawn to the water, 
And if you have a pet that is disabled or very elderly, they really need to be watched. They need company out there because things do happen. And because they wander over to the pool, you never know when they're going to fall in and they're need, going to need to be rescued. So I'm so glad your story turned out wonderfully, Dana. And uh, you are certainly the hero of, uh, of your family and of Rosie. I'm sure I'm Rosie's hero. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, Charlie. Back to what you just did, I commend you to take the courage and go forward. Sometimes people come up here and sling everything against us, <clears throat> and we sit and we nod, and we don't respond. Some people think we shouldn't respond because that lends to an argument. But not setting a record straight with what was accused of you or practically every one of us that sits on this council at one time or another. But to do it in the, in with the courage and the aplomb that you have done with this and running this and setting the record straight, I applaud you. It was wonderful. As, as do I. Really. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you both. I appreciate that. Okay, so now we'll move on to my next comment. And um, this is something very near and dear to my heart. And uh, <clears throat> I wanted to say a huge thank you to our city's Emergency Preparedness Commission and the city staff members for all their hard work and planning, publicizing, and working at the event to make surviving the big one an incredible success. It was standing room only with attendees arriving early to not only make sure they got a seat, but to also enjoy some champagne, Pellegrino, Brandini toffee, and converse with other attendees. Commissioner Bob Brown made the presentation and it introduced our new safety videos produced and filmed by him, starring all the commissioners performing in each video. The professionally done videos showed exactly what to do during a major earthquake in a variety of everyday situations and will be broadcast daily on our Rancho Mirage television. And as always, for attendees to any city event who are hearing impaired, just let us know ahead of time so we can make your experience more enjoyable by providing someone to do signing. Thank you, Jason. Uh, this is an incredible commission, and I'm so proud to have been involved working side by side with them for almost nine years. They are creative, they are dedicated, they are tireless, and they are an extremely vital part of our city. So thank you again to all our emergency preparedness commissioners and to our staff members, and uh, especially Brian Kephart, who is our staff liaison. He does remarkable work. He's always there when we call him. He's always ready to help. He happens to be sitting in our audience, so maybe you can stand up, Brian, so we can applaud you. Thank you so much. And uh, along on those same lines of safety, uh, there's something I'd like to also advertise, and that is the CERT training. This is a community emergency response team, and it's training. It's taking place in Rancho Mirage. Uh, there are two courses that are being offered. CERT is a three-day basic training period. It's usually about 24 hours, and it's spread out over three days. The first training period will be at, uh, on April 8th, 9th, and 10th at 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. each day. And the second one is going to be a refresher course. So if you've already taken the CERT training and would like to brush up on some of your skills, this is a great time to do it. This will take place on April 7th. You must have previously attended a CERT three-day class, and it will be also from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. So the training is free but you must register online first. And for details on registering, please visit the official CERT information page by clicking the image below when you look online. 
So for those people who are not familiar with CERT training, it is learning to be a leader during a disaster. You learn how to use a fire extinguisher. You learn how to uh, take care of people that might be injured. But you also learn how to react when you shouldn't react and how to not do something that might be dangerous to you. So this is vital training. I've done it. My husband has done it. Most people that I know have done it. And everyone raves about how professional the class is and what a joy it is to learn how to be self-sufficient in a disaster uh, and how to help others. So thank you so much. And we hope that you will go online and get more information and want to attend these classes. OK, so that's the end of my comments. So now I would like to move on to what would normally be our city manager's comments. But he is not here today. So we have someone who is uh, very, very important in our city. And that is Jesse Eckenroth. And he is our uh, director of public works. So I will ask Jesse if he has any comments to make. I don't have any comments today. Thank you. Though. OK. So he has no comments. <laughs> See, <laughs> there it goes. There it went. I'm afraid you're not going to live that one down. Say something. I'll take a rain check. <laughs> Jesse works very, very hard and is always on top of everything. He's given some incredible <clears throat> reports, especially on the bridge um, on Frank Sinatra. Yeah. He gave an incredible rundown. He explained everything in fine detail. And he's always there to be helpful whenever we need him. So thank you. Rubberized, rubberized asphalt. <laughs> and absolutely, with our rubberized asphalt. Thank you. And thank you for the reminder, Steve. OK, so now we'll move on to the minutes. And if there are no additions or corrections, may I have a motion to approve? Second. OK, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. OK. Thank you, Christy. And now we'll move back to Jesse, and he will be doing our consent calendar. Thank you. Mayor and council members, there's three items for your consideration today on the consent calendar. The first item is to waive the reading of all ordinances introduced or adopted pursuant to this agenda. Item two is contracts. Item number three is demands. And staff is here to answer any questions. OK. Are there any comments or questions from council? Are there any questions or comments from the uh, public? Seeing none, we'll close the public comments and we'll call for a vote. Motion to approve consent. Thank second. you. And a second. Thank you. Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Christy. And now we'll move on to the action calendar and item number four. And uh, this will be something uh, regarding ordinance Number next in order will be the first reading, adding chapter 8.65, gated residential emergency access to Title VIII. Thank you. And this will be handled by Tyler. So come on in and. All right, good afternoon, Madam Mayor and members of the City Council. I am here today regarding an ordinance that addresses gated communities and emergency access for law enforcement. Staff's recommendation is that the City Council introduce ordinance number next in order, adding Chapter 8.65, Gated Residential Emergency Access to Title VIII, Health and Safety of the Ranch Mars Municipal Code, regarding emergency access for gated residential communities, and that the City Council direct staff to develop a draft reimbursement incentive program per access key system installed within the first six months after the ordinance adoption for Council consideration at the next meeting. For background information, gated communities throughout the city restrict access to the public. And by default, they also restrict access to law enforcement personnel in times of emergency. Currently, Ranch Mirage Sheriff's Department does not have an independent means to access gated communities. Ranch Mirage Sheriff's Department often must rely on external personnel to gain access to emergency situations when impeded by gated structures. These impediments effectively delay the Sheriff's Department's response times. Currently, each restricted access community has their own method of granting access to law enforcement, which has proven to be both complicated and burdensome in practice. The proposed ordinance would require all communities that restrict entry 
to provide a sheriff-approved method of immediate access to law enforcement, voiding any method that requires external personnel. The purpose of the ordinance is to create a standardized method of entry for the sheriff's department, which will decrease variations in response times and streamline the sheriff's department's operations. Typically, this is accomplished through a secured access key that corresponds with a secured gate key switch. Secured gate key switches can override electric gates at the entrance to restricted communities and grant entry to emergency personnel. Provisions of immediate emergency access are mandated for the fire department via the California Fire Code, but such jurisdiction does not extend to the Sheriff's Department. The California Fire Code does not integrate law enforcement personnel into its enforcement provisions. A list obtained from the Office of Riverside County Fire Marshal indicates the City of Ranch Mirage with its various communities has 194 emergency access key boxes installed for the fire department. Knox, who produced emergency access key boxes for the fire department, has proven to effectively streamline the purchase and coordination with emergency personnel with their intuitive implementation process. With this system, our sheriff's department can establish a region, which allows the sheriff's department to be notified of every attempted purchase within the region. The sheriff's department can then approve of the purchase and is in the process of made effectively aware of the purchaser. Importantly, the keys for emergency access boxes can only be obtained by the region owner. Members of the public are unable to obtain these keys. Emergency personnel key boxes will have the same access key as every other box within the region, which will effectively streamline the Sheriff's Department access by creating a uniform method of entry with just the utilization of just one key. If approved by the City Council, each gated community would bear the responsibility of ensuring their method of immediate emergency access is within compliance with the standards set by the Sheriff's Department. The ordinance, once approved, will provide a one-year grace period for existing gated communities to meet the requirements set forth. Gated communities built or approved after the ordinance adoption will be required to comply to the terms and conditions of the ordinance as a requirement of their approval. For your fiscal impact, Knox, who produces emergency keys and key boxes, estimates to purchase one of their switches on a mounting plate would cost $126. If approved by the City Council, the City, the, if approved by the City Council, the City of Ranch Mirage may also provide a reimbursement incentive program for gated communities. The reimbursement program would subsidize incurred costs during the first six months of the ordinance's adoption, doing so with the intention of accelerating compliance. The program would cover the actual costs incurred by gated communities an amount not to exceed $300 per access key system installed. For cost estimates, if 200 emergency access key systems were to be purchased, installed, and certified by the Sheriff's Department during the reimbursement period, the city would receive reimbursement applications totaling $60,000. This concludes my staff report. And Lieutenant Walton of the Sheriff's Department is in attendance today as well and would also like to provide his comments regarding these items. At the conclusion, staff is available for any questions. Well, thank you, Tyler. Are there any questions or comments from council on this side? Yes, I do. Okay. I thought that we all had this at the gates, living in a gated community, but we don't. They are indeed mandated for the fire department via the California Fire Code, but that jurisdiction doesn't extend to the Sheriff's Department. So that is the fire department's unit system. So a central tenet of what this ordinance would do is have a similar system installed that the Sheriff's Department can then utilize and have jurisdiction over. And this is just for City of Rancho Mirage? Yes. The this other city doing for this? Uh, are there other cities doing this? Yeah. Uh, the city of La Quinta has moved forward with the same ordinance, and so they had that system implemented as well. And actually, uh, Lieutenant Walton, with his experience prior to serving for Rancho Mirage, uh, he oversaw that implementation process for the city of La Quinta as well. Right. Well, it seems like a no-brainer, really. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Tyler, uh, as you know, the fire department has a place on your gate. If you're, if you're just a one house, but you're gated, they have a, a box where the owner has to put in it, uh, a key that gets them in past the f fence. Uh, is that key usable by the police to use the same key, or would you have to have a second box 
with a key in it for the police department. Right. Yeah. So the the fire department has expressed that they would the actual key. So the way that the system works is through Knox, that key system that you're referring to that is integrated throughout the city currently for the fire department, that one key works for all of the gates throughout all of the community. So that one key actually works for every single gate within the city of Rancho Mirage. Uh, and so that same key system that they've been provided, they've received that jurisdiction from the California Fire Code, but those same mandates don't extend to the Sheriff's Department. Uh, in discussions with the Fire Department, they have uh, insinuated that for issues of inventory, auditing, and accountability that they would prefer for the Sheriff's Department to have their own system installed. So right now, the, the fire key is not usable by the police department to gain access to that house, or is uh, the key is accessible? The, so they, they do, they can receive their keys from the fire department. So the fire department can receive those keys from Knox, which is the integration system. So because the fire department is the region owner for everyone within the county, the fire department are the only ones that have access to those keys directly. Now, the issue of potentially sharing those keys across departments, the fire department has expressed because of how valuable those keys are and the amount of safety and the different actions that they take in managing that key system, they have expressed that they would prefer to have the sheriff's department have their own key system. Um, and I understand that Lieutenant Walton also has some background experience with that as well. So maybe our next speaker will tell us if we have, if a homeowner, it's just one, one home gated, uh, do they go to the police department to arrange to purchase and install uh, a key that allows the police in in case of emergency? Right, so, um, well, good afternoon, uh, Madam Mayor, City Council, staff, uh, citizens. Um, the individual key that allows entrance into a gated community that's otherwise unmanned, uh, uh, when it comes to the ordinance, uh, relates to more than one home behind a gated community. However, if a citizen who owns a large property that would like to grant police uh, access specifically through this system, we wouldn't block that, we'd, be, we'd invite it if they would like to do that but it's not required in the ordinance. It's two or more homes behind a gated community. So if, if the police department went uh, to a house that was just one house behind a gated community, uh, they would at least try the key that's in, in the box that's on the outside of the gate? Correct, that or we just jump the fence. Okay. Thank you. You know, one of the advantages of this new system is that there are a lot of properties out there with only one lockbox, and they have three or four accesses from the exterior. So yeah. uh, this will allow every box to be operational, and the city will be putting up the, the money, $60,000, as an incentive to get everybody hooked up into this knock system. So there won't be any potential uh, openings or gated areas that don't have the, the Knox box. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct, yes. And not to take away from our, our uh, fellow uh, public safety officials in the fire department, um, this issue is a, a, a near and dear one to the law enforcement community because we are forward deployed. And when issues of medical emergency arise, we are usually the first ones able and, and at those gates waiting. And it's, uh, it's one of those things where we would like to go in uh, sometimes the gates bar us from going in, and we actually watch the fire truck pass us at the gate, even though we were there. So there are potentially 200 additional hookups. Is that right? Yes. And the city will maintain, or city will actually cover the cost for the first six months for these new boxes. I'm not sure about that. I mean, typically when the uh, when the uh, gated community installs the the key cylinder, they they order it, they install it. Um, and then they maintain it thereafter in perpetuity. The city, however, may grant some sort of a, um, a grant or a, a remuneration back to the gated community to help them defray that cost, but only, only as a one-time. That's why we like the right. system. It's a one-time fee. Right. Thank you. Okay. So why don't we take a second and have Steve, our city yeah. man, yeah. attorney, 
kind of clarify this? Yeah, the, the program, if adopted, is going to cover the actual costs incurred by the community. Um, it's a, in an amount not to exceed $300. That's Correct. just for installation. And the city's putting up a total of $60,000 for this program. So we're pay the complete cost. Right, right. Yeah, and the list that was received from the fire marshal that indicates the amount of systems that are already installed within the city, uh, that list maintained about 194 particular units. So that would correspond to roughly 194 particular gates. Now, if directed by city council, the city staff can also offer a reimbursement program to where for every gate that is retrofitted for the sheriff access, we would offer up to 100 or up to $300 per key system installed as a reimbursement incentive with the purpose of trying to accelerate compliance so that way sheriff has faster response times to those gated communities. Okay, thank you. And also, how about if we... Okay, so we're going to hear for just a second with, from Jesse Eckenroth. Yeah, I was just going to provide a little clarification. The current existing knock boxes that are located throughout the city and at HOAs, are, they, the sheriff's department is not able to use those. So if you have an ox box on your facility, that is only for the fire department. It is not for the um, sheriff's department. Uh, and then I just want to reiterate that the, the recommendation here is for staff to draft a reimbursement agreement to bring back to council at the next meeting. So the example of $60,000 was if 200 properties installed an ox box and the cost was $300 a piece. So the specific request would be that uh, staff would draft a reimbursement agreement and bring it back to council for consideration at a later meeting. Very good. Is this a mandatory system that we're putting in to everybody? And also, how will it be implemented? Who does it? Sure, yeah. So if you are in a restricted access community, and if there are two or more housing units behind a gate, then you'd be subject to the ordinance. So if you are just an individual house with your own gate at the entrance to your property, you would not be subject to this ordinance. It would only be for communities of two or more developments. Uh, for implementation, uh, the Sheriff's Department has insinuated that they would like to utilize the NOx system, which the way that that works is pretty intuitive. So the Sheriff's Department would set up a region in which they'd be the region owner. So anytime that a gated community went to purchase the product that they need to comply, the Sheriff's Department is then notified of the attempted purchase. They would receive the contact information as well as the address and location that is listed with the purchase. And then from there, they can work with the gated community to ensure that it is actually reaching the demands of the Sheriff's Department. And then from there, if the reimbursement program is moved forward with, they would be, receive a certification from the Sheriff's Department that they are within compliance, which then they would be able to send to City Hall for reimbursement. Very good. Now, are we putting a timeline that this would have to be done in a year, six months, two years, or whenever? How are you going to do that? Yes, so the ordinance currently states that they would have a one-year grace period to comply. So af if the ordinance is to be passed, then 30 days thereafter, it would be actually approved. And then from there, they would have a full year to comply with the installation. As well as under the reimbursement program, if it is moved forward with the city council, they'd have six months to also receive a reimbursement of up to $300 per system installed. Thank and, you. And the sheriff's department would be doing the installations? Yes. Well, we wouldn't do the installations. We would verify the installations met the code, and then we would provide a um, letter to the property owners or the HOA and let them know that uh, they completed and complied. Okay, but who would be doing the installation? Is that a company that comes the out? Fire to department or the police department. Fire department does it for the fire department. Right. Okay. Um, assume, hypothetically, that this single piece of property with the fence around it uh, is large enough to have a second house uh, on the property. Uh, that then would comply, if I understand, that would comply with the ability of that property with two houses, uh, separate, totally separate, uh, that they would be able to um, have that key put on their fence, uh, forgetting the cost of it, but they would be able to get that key. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
So are you are you asking about two separate homes or a home and a um, guest house? Well, call it a guest house. Call it a separate separate home. Okay, so that would qualify. I mean, if it's if it's a guest house, that has all the all the amenities amenities of a house. Okay, so David, maybe you could fill us in on that. Uh, the ordinance, to my understanding, is to deal with two residential homes as, as designed and built, and so two or more residential homes for individual families to occupy. So if you have a casita that wasn't designed for a second family, um, I would think that that wouldn't comply or wouldn't need to comply. You're not mandated by the ordinance to get an ox key. Okay. Does that help? Well, it tells me where I want to go. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Any other questions from council on this side? Okay. Any questions? The important thing here is that the city is underwriting the cost of sixty thousand dollars. Right. That's a cost that was borne by the sheriff's department in the past, I believe, wasn't it? Uh, no, we haven't had this system at all. So we've we've uh, been uh, devoid this. Uh, opportunity, and we're hoping the city will uh, assist us in getting this entrance. Okay. Thank yeah, you. and as Jesse said, that's not part of this ordinance today. The, we're not dealing with the cost of it. Uh, we're merely approving the ordinance, and then there'll be a separate ordinance or recommendation to come down back to the city council for the reimbursement of this sixty thousand. That's not going to be part of what we're voting on today. Right. Well, what, what, there are two parts here, and B indicates that direct staff to develop a draft reimbursement incentive program for access key system installed. So we will be directing staff to uh, put together a, uh, an incentive program. Yeah. Okay. Right. All right. So are there any questions or comments from the public? Seeing none, we'll close the public comments, and uh, if there are no further questions on the Dias here, we will uh, ask for a motion. Okay, I'll make a motion um, to introduce uh, ordinance next in order, first reading, adding chapter 8.65, Gated Residential Emergency Access, Title Eight, Health and Safety of the Rancho Mirage M Municipal Code regarding emergency access for gated residential communities, and B, direct staff to develop a draft reimbursement incentive program per access key system installed within the first six months after the ordinance adoption for council consideration at the next meeting. Okay, and I will second that. Second. So pl please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Okay, thank you so much, Christy. And also, I wanted to take a second to thank uh, Tyler. Uh, Tyler, folks, for those people who don't know him, is uh, a big part of our city. He is an administrative analyst, and you always put together great reports, so I want to thank you. Thank you. Okay. And he's official because he now has a nameplate on his desk. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Thank you. All right. So now we'll move on to item number five, and that is going to be handled by Joseph Carpenter. He is our finance manager, and this is regarding fiscal year 2019-2020 mid-year budget adjustments. And welcome. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, before I get started, I would just like to take a moment to thank the 2019-2020 uh, Mid-Year Budget Adjustment Subcommittee, consisting of Mayor Pro Tem Hobart and Councilmember Kite, for their time reviewing the budget adjustments in the staff report. Thank you both. Members of the City Council, today's presentation will highlight the proposed fiscal year 1920 mid-year budget adjustments. The current operating budget adopted by City Council on June 6, 2019, includes approximately 28.2 $28.2 million in revenue and $27.1 million in expenditures. Staff is proposing mid-year adjustments of $1,175,000 in operating revenue and approximately $236,000 in operating expenditures, which would increase the proposed operating surplus almost $940,000 from $1.1 million 
to 2.1 million. The detail of the proposed operating budget adjustments will be covered over the next two slides. Staff is requesting to increase budgeted operating revenues $1,175,000. Staff anticipates the city will receive $300,000 more in sales and use tax, the result of increased sales tax collections, $515,000 in development related fees due to increased building activity, primarily the result of the Del Webb project, and $360,000 in newly established fees. These fees were adopted by the City Council in April 2019 and became effective July 1, 2019. Staff is requesting to increase budgeted operating expenditures by approximately $236,000 for the fiscal year. General fund operating expenditures are broken down into three object levels. Personnel, which includes salaries and benefits, operations and maintenance, and department equipment. The proposed $9,000 increase in department equipment represents the difference between the budgeted and actual cost of the new traffic safety truck. The approximately $227,000 increase in the operations and maintenance object level is comprised of budget adjustments in four divisions. A $50,000 increase for the city attorney due to higher legal services, a $50,000 increase in building and safety due to increased development activity, a $89,500 increase in engineering due to the retirement of the city engineer, and approximately $38,000 in special programs for two previously approved budget adjustments to purchase AEDs for the Rancho Mirage High School and $12,000 for a donation to the Children's Discovery Museum of the Desert for the purchase of an air conditioning unit. Lastly, there were two non-operating or capital budget adjustments, both of which were previously approved by the City Council. In January of this year, the City Council approved a one-time donation to Eisenhower Health for the Cove Community's cardiology campaign, and in September 2019, the City Council approved the payoff of the City's unfunded pension liability. The General Fund Summary outlines the impact of the previously approved and proposed general fund budget adjustments. To recap, the operating budget adjustments covered in today's presentation will add approximately $940,000 to operating surplus. The two previously approved non-operating budget adjustments will increase reserve spending approximately $3.37 million. The adopted general fund budget, including both operating and non-operating budgets, included reserve spending of approximately $741,000. The budget adjustments discussed today intend to increase fund balance spending $2.4 million, resulting in a revised estimate of reserve spending of approximately $3.1 million for the fiscal year. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time and consideration this afternoon. Staff is available to answer any questions. Well, thank you, Joseph. Are there any questions on this side of the dais? No, nope. on this side? Nope. Okay, are there any questions or comments from the public? Seeing none, we'll close the public comments and we will move forward with a, uh, a motion. I will make the motion that the City Council adopt resolution number 2020 next in order, approving and adopting the fiscal year 2019-2020 mid-year budget adjustment. Second. Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Christy. Okay, so now we are going to move on to our item number six. And this is uh, going to be presented by Jesse Eckenroth and uh, one of our directors of, actually, the director from Public Works. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, Council members. Uh, this staff report provides framework for a discussion on the coronavirus. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention commonly referred to as the CDC, does an excellent job with providing current information on their website. The World Health Organization is also providing up-to-date information on the coronavirus. So uh, Jason's gonna have these two slides up, so if anyone's at home, um, these are excellent resources to go to. Uh, there's gonna be another slide that comes up too to give the World Health Organization uh, website. And both of these, uh, 
Websites are very intuitive, have up-to-date information, and are excellent resources with practical tips. The CDC website updated the Coronavirus Disease 2019 Situation Summary this Tuesday, March the 3rd, citing that for most of the American public who are unlikely to be exposed to the virus at this time, the immediate health risk from uh, the coronavirus is considered low. But both the CDC and the World Health Organization give many practical ways to limit your exposure to risk. The World Health Organization has the following protective measures on their list. Wash your hands regularly and thoroughly. Maintain social distance, distancing, so three feet between yourself and anyone who is coughing or sneezing. Avoid touching eyes, nose, and mouth. Practice respiratory hygiene. Uh, cover your mouth and nose when you sneeze or cough. If you have a fever, cough, or difficulty breathing, seek medical care early. And stay informed and follow advice given by your local health care provider. Uh, fortunately for the city of Rancho Mirage, Eisenhower Health is taking a proactive approach. And in addition to their standard infectious disease protocol, Eisenhower Health is following the CDC guidelines for the coronavirus. So this concludes uh, my presentation on uh, the staff report and can open it up for council discussion. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Jesse. Is there anyone on the council that would like to make comments or ask questions? Just a brief comment, uh, Madam Mayor. The, the figures as of today showed that there was 177 people who actually had cont contracted the disease. So uh, a lot of those are on the East Coast. Uh, so far, California, I don't think, has any uh, individuals. But they did approve an $8 billion expense today uh, in Washington. $3 billion of that will go to testing, and the other $5 billion will go to containment issues. So there's a lot of money being spent right now, and it was bipartisan, fortunately, to get this approved. And uh, I think uh, the uh, government finally realizes the immediacy of what they've got to do, and they put up the money to uh, move forward with it. So uh, right now, everybody's just waiting to see how well the testing does and how many people they're able to test in a short period of time. Okay, thank you, Richard. It's always good to have these updates. Anyone on this side? Yeah, just at the 12 o'clock news before I came here that the uh, governor said that there were no cases in the Coachella Valley or Riverside as of today. Just So they're keeping a very big eye on it, but you never know. Yeah, yeah the, uh, the city that's really experiencing a lot of uh, disease is Seattle. Yeah. And Seattle has uh, been under uh, a lot of uh, individual testing. So they've actually made a uh, situation where they're going to shut down their schools. You have these. 10 deaths in uh, right. northern uh, Washington. So we haven't got to the point where we're going to shut down any activities or schools, but that's certainly something that's being looked at in other parts of the country. Absolutely. And it's very encouraging when I see people and everyone has the uh, same attitude that, you know, the new thing is uh, they're trying to stay six feet away from anyone. That might be suspect, and uh, everyone is doing the uh, the fist punch or an elbow or a knee or whatever is handy. So everyone's taking this very seriously. So uh, I want to thank you so much for updates and thank you, Jesse, for that report. And uh, there is no action needed on this. So I just give our thanks for everyone and uh, try to stay healthy and stay away from anyone that's sick. So now we'll move on to uh, closed session. And Steve Cantinea, our city attorney, is going to be giving us an update. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Oh, excuse me. Um, on, on the coronavirus. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. Uh, Okay. 
Yeah, Eisenhower is actually taking some proactive approaches. So they have, uh, they're in, um, following the CDC guidelines in addition to the uh, infectious protocol that they have. They are uh, discussing with their staff on the protocol. So they are well aware of it and they are training their staff on how to handle it. But great comment, but yes, they are addressing it. Thank you. Okay. Okay, excuse me. Well, Can why don't you, and, and if you yeah. come me. up to the podium? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. My name is William, <clears throat> William Lynch. I'm, I'm curious. Uh, I, would, I would imagine that somebody is working on a vaccine. And, once, and so, so I assume that they haven't come up with a vaccine yet. So once they do get the vaccine, hopefully, will everybody have to take that vaccine? And how far does anybody know that development of that vaccine is coming along? Right now, a good guess is all you need because it's a long ways off still. So you got a lot of time to get the answer to that question. Nobody here could answer that question because nobody has any idea where they are, where anybody is specifically at this moment in time. So keep your fingers crossed and stay away from people who sneeze. Madam Mayor. Yes, Richard. There was a meeting today of various pharmaceutical companies with the president, and there are a number of companies that are doing uh, experimental uh, testing, but they say even if they were to find something today, it could take anywhere between a year and a year and a half to get it out to the public. So it's something that the government is all of a sudden putting some money behind it now. But they were, they, uh, this morning and this afternoon, they were working with various pharmaceutical companies. Okay, well, it's all positive stuff that we're learning. And so everyone- Just take time, it, that's all. It, It'll take time, and everyone out there, I, I know you're all staying tuned to your televisions and uh, getting updates as they come along, so every day is gonna be a new update, and uh, we'll be on top of it. Thank you. Okay, so moving back to Steve. I'll try this again. Um, so the City Council is now gonna recess into closed session um, regarding three potential initiation of litigation items. That's pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9D4. The council will also confer with city attorney regarding existing litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.9D1. That involves the case known as Save Rancho Mirage versus City of Rancho Mirage. I too want to see that end. And the council will be discussing, discussing another existing litigation item um, pursuant to government code section 54956.9D1. However, we don't disclose the name of the case because that may jeopardize existing settlement negotiations. We do have another item on the closed session calendar. That's item number one, which we do not need to discuss. Okay, thank you, Stephen. So that ends our city council meeting. We will see you again here on uh, March 19th. So stay safe, stay healthy, and just have good times.